one of your younger brothers in Christ has wonderfully read to you the portion of Scripture that we are going to expound on this morning. Slightly higher. Thank you. I want to welcome all those people that are joining us by way of the video broadcast. Um, we thank God for the opportunity we have and that you have today for us to share the word of the Lord with you and for you to uh, share in growing in the knowledge of God with us, growing together, understanding our God and pleasing Him. And so we continue with the second part of our message. Last week we spoke the first part, which was the humiliation of Christ. And this morning we're going to continue with the second part and I'm going to just read to you from verse 5, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death of the cross. And we stopped there last week and we spoke about, not just spoke about, wonderfully preached and taught about these steps that... The Son of God took in leaving His throne in glory and coming down to earth, making Himself appear, giving the appearance, coming in the likeness of man. And we called that doctrine, we call that steps that He took, the incarnation where the Son of God became flesh and became the sacrifice for you and I that we may be released from the curse of sin and death. There is no time to go over even a little bit of what I spoke last week, so you need to get the notes online for that. This morning we're going to continue with verse 9, which says, Therefore God highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let's read that again from verse 9. Therefore God highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth. Verse 11. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You've read this many times and I don't doubt that you know what this means. But I ask you to permit me today to continue with this doctrine that we began last week. And share with you what we as a church believe about this next portion of scripture from verse 9 to verse 11. These words that are in the scripture uh, have occupied the lines and the lyrics of songs for many years. We sing about it in church we shout about it in our amens and hallelujahs. We are in agreement when we pray that His name is above every name. And this morning I want to spend a few moments just talking to you so that you really understand what this scripture means. So the exaltation of Jesus is what we're going to be speaking about this morning. The, exalt the exaltation was His reward for His humiliation. Last week we spoke about his humiliation because he humbled himself. God exalted him and highly exalted him at that. We see in the first part his humiliation. In the second part, his exaltation. In the first part from verse 5 to verse 8, we see his humiliation. In the second part, verse 9 to verse 11, we see his exaltation. In the first part, we see the downward steps that he took. You need to be careful of that. The downward steps that he took, the incarnation. In the second part, the upward steps that the Father took in His exaltation. In the first part, Jesus took the step down. The Father did not force Him to take those steps. Jesus willingly gave in to the will of God, the Father, and took those steps and came down. And every step He took was a step lower than what His original state was. So He took those steps, and we call that the incarnation. And the upward steps we're going to look at this morning is the steps that the Father took in exalting the Son. The combination of the downward and the upward steps, the humiliation and the exaltation is what makes this scripture profound and what gives our faith genuine meaning. It is important to know that the one cannot exist without the other. The exaltation, sorry, the humiliation and the exaltation go together. They recognize each other. 
Because he humbled himself, God elevated him. Let me rephrase that. God highly exalted him. However, there are those who focus majorly on the humiliation of the Son and there are those who focus majorly on the exaltation of the Son. Like we have in churches today, those who would only concentrate on the Father and then those who would say, this is the Jesus generation and then they would say, this is the dispensation of the Holy Spirit and so we only worry about the Holy Spirit. So everything is Holy Spirit charged and then there's this division in the church. No, we believe in that and we believe... And so we have this failure to recognize the Godhead, the fullness of the Trinity, where we focus on one more than the other. And that's contrary to Scripture because when you read your Bible, you understand that they work together for our benefit and for the glory of God. So there are those who focus majorly on the humiliation and then other churches focus mainly on the exaltation. And for example, in the Roman Catholic Church, there's a constant reminder on the back wall. There's a constant reminder in the holy places of the crucifix, Jesus still on the cross. A representation of His suffering. You walk into the church, you see pictures of Jesus crying and weeping. and they, they, The pictures of Jesus are really suffering and you feel sorry for Jesus because of what He has done. He's, the sacrifice that He made and it moves us. On the other hand, we have other churches, the Protestant churches, which we are a part of. The Protestant churches, there's a constant reminder that the cross is empty, the tomb is empty, and that He is risen. Both are true, and both have a real impact. But both of them working together only can save a dying world. You cannot separate one from the other. You cannot have the humiliation only, neither can you have the exaltation only, because it is a story that is incomplete. The reason why he is exalted is because he humbled himself. You cannot celebrate the exaltation if you don't understand the humiliation. And if you don't understand the humiliation, you cannot appreciate the exaltation. Why do you say His name is above every name? Why do you say that Jesus is Lord? You cannot say that Jesus is Lord if you do not understand what it is all about. If you do not understand the steps that He took. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit reminds you of what Jesus has done. Nobody can say that Jesus Christ is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. And what does the Holy Spirit do? It reminds you of what Jesus has done. Watching that clip this morning, I almost, I've seen it so many times. I personally chose every clip that you see, I personally choose. I watched that clip, I don't know how many times, but this morning I almost broke down crying, thinking that it's not about us, it's about Jesus. It's not about us, it's about Jesus. Both those things working together, the humiliation and the exaltation working together can save this dying world. You cannot bring people to church and only say, well, He is risen! And not learn from the humiliation of Christ. The servant heart of Christ. They, they go together. For the believer, Jesus is our rock, our anchor, our assurance, not, be, not just because He came to die for us and was humiliated for us, but because He's exalted. God exalted Him. It is the humiliation and the exaltation that makes Him our anchor. He cannot be our anchor only if He's the humiliation. Neither can He be our anchor only because He's the exaltation. Oh, He's exalted. Both of them working together, He's humbled Himself and God highly exalted Him. That makes Him our anchor. It is the humiliation and the exaltation that makes our redemption complete. You are saved, you are redeemed. And when the, the song that we, we used to sing, we caught from the Americans, and we, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. What are you saying? What are you saying? When you say, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. What are you saying? You are saying that Jesus came, He humbled Himself, He died on the cross, He laid down His life, He took those downward steps to serve us, and that God highly exalted him. Therefore, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Both go together. The humiliation and the exaltation go together. And we must not separate them. Apart from Philippians 2 verse 9 to 11, the only other scripture that speaks 
profoundly, wonderfully about his exaltation is in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 2 to 4. You don't have to turn there right now. I'll read it for you. You that are making notes and following by way of the broad broadcast. This is what it says in Hebrews. And I'm going to pick up the story. Um, it says, has, Jesus has in these last days, or God has in these last days, spoken to us by His Son, whom He has appointed heir over all things, through whom also He made the worlds, who being the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person and upholding all things by the power or the word of His power, when he, had, when he had himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. That's an expansion to your understanding of, Hebrew, of uh, uh, Philippians 2, verse 9 to 11. Hebrews 1, verse 2 to 4, what I've just read, expands that. Also in the book of Hebrews, you'll find in Hebrews 1.6, this is what it says. When he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Lord, all the angels of God worship him. Why? Because of what he'd done. Hebrews 1.8, but to the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. Hebrews 1.13 says this, but to which of the angels, as he ever said, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. We have this picture of how God the Father exalted the Son for what He had done. We can even stop right here and say, listen, what can we get so far from last week's message and these last few minutes? When you humble yourself, it is not man who exalts you, but God who exalts you. Do not look to me to give you a pat on the back. Do not look to somebody to give you a pat on the back. We can only say, well done. And we can only say thank you, but it is God who exalts you. It is God who promotes you. It is God who lifts you up, not only in your thinking, not only in your belief, not only in your faith, but in favor and in blessing. It is God who exalts you. So the source of Christ's exaltation, we're going to spend a few moments on this and give you some subheadings as I begin to speak. Verse 9, the first part of verse 9, Therefore God highly exalted him. What is the source of Christ's exaltation? Let's read that. For this reason, some of your Bibles might say, for this reason. For this reason refers back to the previous verses. What is the reason? For this reason, it is Jesus' humiliation, His downward steps, the steps that He took as described in my last message. For that reason, and that reason only, because he endured the cross, because he took those downward steps, he was despised and shamed and shuffered and suffered the hostility of the world, hostility of sinners. For this reason, he now sits at the right hand of God. We learn that the way to exaltation begins with humility. Many of our preachers of the past coined it in these words, the way up is the way down. The way up is the way down. It is not the way of the world. The world tells us differently. The way up is the way down. If that principle was true for the Son of God, how much more should it be for us, His followers? We who say we are Christians are the ones who should be laying ourselves down, like I told you in the story last week of the two goats who met on that road and how the one laid himself flat so that the other one could walk over him. One of the biggest things I've had to do talking with people yesterday at the conference over the tables that we were sharing, one of the biggest, they said to me, it must be so difficult for you to have gone through what you went through, asking for forgiveness, saying sorry for the mistakes you made. I said, you have no idea how difficult it has been because when you expose yourself like that, you become naked before people. Nobody could take advantage over me before, but the number of people who just, you know, you know do you know why pastors sometimes don't talk to people? Because familiarity breeds contempt. So what do pastors do? They put a block, they put a wall so that you don't, you don't take advantage over them. And I found that even the more familiar I am with you, that you do take advantage. But it's okay. I'm sitting with you in Bible study. I'm talking with you about the same scripture. I'm sitting with you and praying with you. I'm sitting and helping you and pushing you along to learn the scriptures. 
Not familiarity can often, the lines can be blurred sometimes. You don't know where to respect and when not to respect. But I'm okay with that now. I got over that. Because I understand the example of Jesus. That He made Himself naked before the people. Even when He washed feet, He emptied Himself. He made Himself naked. He stripped Himself down completely. Master, what are you doing? And He washed feet. That nakedness can often bring with it this idea that you become a doormat and people walk all over you. I don't want to share with you, you are not that person. Because you're a Christian. I'm a Christian. Our example is not Bill Gates. Our example is not Justin Bieber. Our example is not Will I Am. Our example is not the Prime Minister or the people of this world. Our example is not for ladies who is, a, 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 I don't know some names. I, I, I don't know. You know more than me. I, not those people. Our example is Christ. The battle in your life is the conflict between two worlds. I know what I need to do, but I end up doing that. This is Paul's life. Paul says, what I want to do, I find myself not doing. I know I need to do this, but I don't do it. Why? Because I get swayed into the world. We want to please God. We want to live as Christians, but we become like the world and says, nobody should take advantage over me. I'm not a doormat. Here we find in the humiliation of Jesus... He suffers the austerity of sinners. They pull on his beard, they spit in his face. And like you heard in the communion reading this morning, if you are God, why don't you pray and God will save you? If you are a Christian, why are you suffering? Look at you, you are worthless. Why are you struggling? Why aren't your children going to church? Why isn't your marriage working out? Why, aren't you, why don't you have money? Why are you suffering? Why are you struggling? And we become this doormat, we become this thing that people take advantage of. Christ suffered the hostility of sinners and because of that, God highly exalted Him. I remind you to remain humble. I remind you to remain naked. I remind you to remain at a place of humility because it is God and God alone who will exalt you. Highly exalted translates from a compound verb in the Greek, it's composed of two words put together. The first word in the Greek is spelled H-U-P-E-R, huper, which means over. The second word which makes up the compound verb is the word hupsu, H-U-P-S-W, sorry, S-W-O, <laughs> which means to lift or raise up. The first one means over. The second one, to lift or raise up. God lifted up His Son in the most magnificent and possible way. This involved four steps, and I'm going to share that with you. So we looked at the steps down that Jesus took. Now we're going to look at the steps that God the Father took in exalting His Son. Like we saw, the Son takes the downward steps. God, the Father, raises Him up in four steps. Are you ready? I'm going to give them for you, and then we're going to talk about them. First, His resurrection. Second, His ascension. Third, His coronation. And fourth, His intercession. And the fourth one speaks, when I speak of His intercession, I will be speaking of His role as the high priest. So number one, His resurrection. Number two, His ascension. Number three, His coronation. And number four, His intercession, His role as a high priest. So the first upward step, His resurrection. What a wonderful thing. We speak of it. We wonderfully sing of it. We preach about it. His resurrection. His resurrection of which the angels told the woman who came to attend to his tomb. The woman came to look after the body of Jesus. And they were given these words. They were given these words by God's messengers. And these are the words they take back to Peter. And what are the words? He's not here. He is risen. That was the words that was conveyed to Peter. Those words have become the words of every evangelist. Evangelists all over the world, this is the, the thrust behind evangelism is this. He is not dead, he's alive. He's not dead, he's risen. Paul later writes to the church at Ephesus saying, God the Father raised Jesus from the dead and seated him 
at the right hand in heavenly places. Paul is reminding the church of who Jesus is. God the Father raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in heavenly places. The second upward step is his ascension. And you know the story, so many people. Jesus appears to the chosen few after his resurrection and Paul ex explains this to Timothy and says this, Jesus was taken up in glory. His ascension, his resurrection, his ascension. The third step. The third step was his coronation. And we've heard that word over the last few weeks over and over again on Sky and BBC and the coronation of the Queen. So you understand a little bit about what that is. You can picture it, the coronation. The third step was his coronation. At his coronation, Jesus was given the seat at the right hand of God. Hallelujah. For the steps that he took downwards, God exalted him. His first step was the resurrection. His second step was the ascension. And the third step was the seat that God had given him, his coronation. And not just any seat, a seat at the right hand of God. And God exalts you. God exalts you. There is a testimony that you know, that you know that you know. That before you even speak it, that you know it was God and God alone who did it, nobody else. There are many testimonies that you can say about how things worked and blah, 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 and so forth and so on. But you know somehow, somewhere, you had a hand in working the thing out. But there's some testimonies where you know that it was, listen, it was nobody else but God. Stephen was about to die after being stoned. It is recorded in Acts chapter 7, verse 55. 56 and this is what he says but he being full of the Holy Spirit gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and what do you see and he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said look I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God he saw Jesus in his coronation the songs that are sung in heaven of his coronation are found in Revelation 5 verse 12 to 13 there are songs that speak of His majesty, songs that speak of the one who sits at the right hand of God. It says this in Revelation 5 verse 12 to 13, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to Him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Hallelujah. And giving glory to the majesty, giving glory to the one who is on the throne. The fourth and final step, His final upward step, was is His intercession. His role as high priest. From this position, he continuously, continually intercedes for the church. Isn't it marvelous to know that Jesus didn't just come and die on the cross, but God exalted him, raised him. He's ascended to heaven. He occupies the seat of the majesty. And he intercedes for us today. He intercedes for the church. Christ who died was raised for us and now intercedes for us. We studied this in Romans. It says in chapter 8 verse 34, It is Christ who died. Furthermore, is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who makes intercession for us. Probably the first role in his new position as the high priest was to send the Holy Spirit. Look at the marvelous way he treats his role. John 16, 7 says this, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is, in, it is to your advantage that I go. For if I do not go, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. What is he speaking about? He's speaking about the Holy Spirit. 
So you and I that understand the wonderfulness of the Holy Spirit, do we really understand how it works? That it was His humiliation and His exaltation that brought the Holy Spirit to us. It's important, Jesus says, that I go. If I don't go, He's not going to come. But if I go, I'm going to be seated at the right hand of God. I'm going to be your intercessor. My first responsibility is to send you the Holy Spirit. Why? Because I don't want you to be alone. He's going to be your helper. These passages you've just heard, as well as many other passages of Scripture, you'll see that in many ways Jesus received even more in His exaltation than what He had surrendered in His incarnation. Of course, He was not more divine or more perfect. It was not possible to elevate Him higher than what He was. However, because of His redemptive work, because of what He had done on the cross, the Father bestowed upon the Son even more rights and more privileges and more responsibilities than ever before. He cannot change the deity of God. He's God. He changes not. But because of His humiliation, God exalted Him and gave more responsibility to Him. Isn't it amazing? You thought when you became a Christian it would be easier. But you find that when you became a Christian, you had more responsibility. Too much is given, much is quiet, expected. It's true. The more responsibility, and these are not hard responsibilities. These are amazing responsibilities that he has no problem in fulfilling. Included in that responsibility is that of mediator, intercessor. Included in that responsibility is another one. He has now the responsibility of judge. God highly exalted him because of his humiliation. God highly exalted him, made him an intercessor, made him a judge. Listen to what it says in the Bible for the, uh, 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 for the father judges in John 5, 22 to 23. It says, for the father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the son. Second Corinthians 5.10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Christ is now the judge. God exalted him to that position. What is the title of his exaltation? What is the title in verse 9, the second part of verse 9 says, and given him a name which is above every name. So we understand the source of his exaltation is God the Father. The title given to him bestowed upon him the name which is above every name. Are you following my train of thought right now? Jesus so completely satisfied the Father in fulfilling the work of his incarnation, in providing redemption for you and I, that the Father conferred upon him, generously gave him, the exalted title which we have on the screen, the name above every name. God gave him the name above every name. He so wonderfully served and subjected himself to the hostility of the world that God exalted him and gave him a name that is above every name. That name is, that he has given is far superior, incomparable. It is of the highest order, it is of the most highest quality, a name of the highest degree, and surpassing all other superior names. If there is any other name that is superior, this is the name that is given to him that is above all of those names. The title that's been given to Christ in his exaltation. Paul does not tell us what this name is. Well, I'll rephrase that. It doesn't tell us immediately what this name is. But in verse 11, if you look at verse 11, it says that every tongue, should, every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. What is the name given to Him? Lord. Lord is the title. Lord is the name given to Him. Well, Paul does not tell us immediately like you've heard me say. But every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Lord is the title of majesty, authority, honor, sovereignty. And that title will also one day be shouted out in the following way. He's the King of Kings and He's the Lord of Lords. Obviously this 
word Lord used in the sense of his ultimate sovereignty and authority outranks all other names. Whoever is Lord is over everyone else. That is precisely the point. The Father makes this point that the Father gave him the title of Lord. He has absolute supremacy and the right to be obeyed as divine master. Why do you obey him? Why do you submit to him? Because God highly exalted him and gave him a name that is above every name. Are you with me right now? What is the response to Christ's exaltation? Verse 10, look at verse 10. And that the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven, and those on earth, and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. We must be careful. I will pause here for a moment. We must be careful. And pay attention to the scripture. For the scripture says in your Bible, you read it very carefully, go over it, go over it with me. It says, but at the name of Jesus, the name of Jesus, rather than at the name Jesus. Can you see that in your Bibles? It doesn't say at the name Jesus. It says at the name of Jesus. Somebody shout off Jesus. At the name of Jesus. It doesn't say at the name Jesus. It says at the name of Jesus. There's a difference and we must take note of it. So what then is the name of Jesus? The name of Jesus is the curios, which is called Lord. The name that is given to him is Lord. At the name of Jesus, which is Lord, every knee should bow and every tongue will confess. That Jesus Christ is Lord. Still referring to Jesus with his earthly name connects us with his incarnation. So when you remember, God did not take away the name Jesus. He leaves the name Jesus so we can connect him with what he's done. We remember Jesus in his humility. We remember Lord in his exaltation. The name of Jesus is his earthly name name given at his birth. Jesus was a common name used in the New Testament times and obviously, obviously that name had nothing, when, when people were naming their children Jesus, there was nothing unique or special about it. It didn't require any supreme worship or authority. We must acknowledge that although Jesus, the common name, is not the name that is exalted but is the name that is given to him which is Lord because of what he had done. Jesus Christ is Lord. What is the response to his, this exaltation? As we hear this today, as you read it in your Bible, Jesus was humiliated and then exalted. What is our response to his exaltation? First response. First response to his exaltation. This is what we have to do. This is what happens, not what we have to do, but what happens. The response, the first response to Christ's exaltation is in verse... Verse 10 and verse 11, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. The first response is, every knee should bow. In the current monarchy, they will find that as you watched the jubilee unfold over those days, there were people who say, yes, your majesty. And the people say, good to meet you. How are you doing, mate? Choice. The monarchy doesn't force anybody to curtsy. Because you'll find that those who will shake their hands and those who will not, I mean, they will, they will curtsy. And then those who don't want to do that. Have you heard of the monarchy forcing anybody to do it? No. Same with Jesus. He never forces you to bow. But when you understand the humiliation and you understand the exaltation and you understand where he's seated, every knee will bow. Listen to this right now. To bow means to submit 
and the submission to his lordship. I'm giving you so many points, I don't know how far you're going to go with this. Another three categories. The submission to his lordship. Number one, those in heaven. For what does it say? Every knee should bow and every tongue should confess. Number one, for those in heaven. Number two, those on earth. And number three, those under the earth. Number one, those in heaven. And those in heaven include all the holy angels, all the hosts of heaven. Hmm. The saints and the redeemed, the believers of all ages. They have no problem with doing this. Why? Heaven has no problem with doing this. Why? Because they're already in a state of worship. They've got no problem with it. Jesus Christ is Lord. Hey, no problem. We do this. We worship Him. We see Him. Seated at the right hand of God. We've got no problem with this. Every knee should bow and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord second to those who are on the earth. And those who are on the earth are both the redeemed and the unredeemed. The redeemed will continue to worship Him from the time they are saved. If you're genuinely saved, and I mean that, don't get upset about my words. There are those who are saved and there are those who think they are saved. When you are genuinely saved, worship is not a problem for you. Worship is not a problem. Whether people play the right music, whether they sing the right song, whether they say the right scripture, it makes no sense to you. It doesn't, sorry, it makes no difference to you because you saved. You see God. <laughs> You've been delivered from the powers of darkness. You understand He died for you. So whether they strike the wrong key, wrong note, sing, whether they're tone deaf or don't even sing correctly, it does not matter. You don't need someone to entertain you because you're here to worship God. Your view of God determines your worship of God. How you see Him, if you see Him highly exalted, you worship Him that way. The redeemed will continue to worship Him from the time they're saved. And at the same time, the unredeemed will be forced to bow their knees before Him one day. The unredeemed will be forced to bow their knees. We find this in 2 Thessalonians, and this is what it says, concerning the judgment and the glory. It says, And the Lord Jesus revealed from heaven with His mighty angels, in flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God, and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And they, these shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. The third group, the first one was those in heaven, those on the earth. And the third one, those who will worship God and exalt Him are those who are under the earth. These are the fallen angels and the unredeemed dead. Those who are waiting for final judgment. Did you get that? In the upward step in his exaltation, the Son of God was predicted by the prophet Isaiah. The exaltation of the Son of God. Isaiah saw it. Isaiah, this amazing prophet of God, saw it. Isaiah 45, 23 says this, I swore, I have sworn by myself the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return, that to me every knee shall bow and every tongue shall take an oath. It's in the Old Testament. Isaiah says that one day every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And the word tongue, the word tongue, we've gone over this last year. You were with us last year. Was it last year? Yes. Last year when we spent six months talking about our doctrine on speaking in tongues, you would have come across this word glossa. The word tongue, which is glossa, is frequently used to represent a language. And no matter what their tongue, no matter what the glossa, Every language, every human being, and every angelic being will have to declare that Jesus is Lord. That's what that means. When it says every tongue, it doesn't mean you have to speak in tongues to declare Him Lord. No, every tongue means every language, every human being, no matter where you are, no matter what language you speak, will declare the Lordship of Jesus. Holy angels, the redeemed saints in heaven and on earth and all the enemies of God on earth and in hell will bow their knees before His sovereign authority. Even the demons, including Satan, will have no choice but to agree and confess 
the reality that Jesus Christ is Lord. Concerning his lordship, R.A. Torrey, a Christian author, writes this. I quote from his book. He said, the second president of Moody, not, Mo not Moodley, Moody, <laughs> Moody Bible Institute said, our, our relationship to Christ is based on his death and resurrection, and this means his lordship. Indeed, the lordship of Christ over the lives of his people was the very purpose for which he died and rose again. We have to acknowledge Christ as our Lord. Sin is rebellion. And it is only when we surrender to Him as Lord that we receive our pardon from Him as our Savior. We have to admit Him on the throne of our heart. And it is only when He is glorified in our hearts as King that the Holy Spirit enters and abides. Last point. What is the purpose of His exaltation? The purpose of His exaltation is seen in the last part of verse 11. Verse 11 says, And every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. For what? To the glory of God the Father. Even in His exaltation, it is for the glory of God the Father. You humble yourself. God exalts you. But when God exalts you, you still remain in a place of humbleness. Why? Because it is for God's glory and not for yours. Will you take that with you today? That it is not for your glory, but for God's glory. He who exalted you to that job, he who gave you that family, he who has blessed you financially, is not for that you may say how good you are, but it is for God's glory. I will conclude with this. This scripture, Philippians 2, 5 to 11 preached and taught to you in two parts last week and today. What difference does it make to your life as a Christian today? What, is, what difference does it make? How does it apply to you? I'm hoping that the Holy Spirit will help you understand and apply this in three areas. Number one, that you understand that your redemption is secure. Number two, that in the incarnation we will see the humility example, the example of ultimate humility and that we should be Modeling our lives on that humility. Number three, the Son of God has been exalted by God. That we are given the, the picture of His position and status. And this should be our prompting for worship. On this point, I conclude my message here today and I say to you that our view of God, as I mentioned this before, our view of God determines our worship of God. This is the mark of a church that knows God. The mark of a church that has a high view of God. I close my message with this story. We've been wonderfully entertained at the Jubilee concert and watched it over t you know, TV and in high definition. And what a fantastic weekend it has been in uniting the country. The monarch who was celebrated and had three cheers at various places was once a child and when she was a child, Queen Elizabeth was a child and her parents held a garden party at Buckingham Palace but a rainstorm forced the party to move indoors. Elizabeth and her younger sister wandered into the room where the guests were gathered and were politely bombarded with questions. During a pause in the conversation, Elizabeth pointed to a nearby wall and a painting of Jesus on the cross. She remarked, That's the man, my papa says, who was really the king. Even a monarch knows who the real king is. You all see us as the monarchy. Yes, great, but I've been taught from an early age who the real king is. That's the real king. You're gathering around me to ask me all this question. But Papa says, that's the real king. Do you know who your king is? Do you recognize who the real king is? I hope that with this part one and part two, that you understand the humiliation and the exaltation of Christ. And that your lives 
may be enriched for the better in Jesus' name. God bless you. Come.